welcome to the session on critical place-based community-engaged learning constraints and possibilities. My name is Ann Dayton. I will be facilitating this session. I am the Director of Co-Curricular Learning at the University of Houston. The University of Houston Faculty Senate acknowledges and honors the Indigenous people's stewardship of the coastal plains, bayous, lakes, and rivers within and beyond the campus as, as sites of ancestral homeland. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat uh, or drop your LinkedIn profile so we can get to know each other. You might also want to share why you chose to attend this particular session so our panelists can have a better idea of who's in the audience. I will be watching the chat throughout the session and uh, sharing questions. We will have time for questions after both of the presentations. Today, we have presentations from Elon University and Tulane University. The presenters will introduce themselves and their teams. And we will begin with Sandy Marshall from Elon University. Thank you very much, Anne, and thank you, Araceli, and welcome everybody um, to this session. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, kicking off the session, uh, we're beginning with our presentation, Replace Pedagogies for Remaking Places and Spaces Together. Uh, before we get into that, I would first like to uh, acknowledge that we are joining you from Burlington City in Alamance, North Carolina home to the Catawba, Eno, Shokori, Sispaha peoples and the Okanichi Band of the Saponi peoples. We acknowledge, honor and respect their longstanding history and contemporary connection to this land. A little bit about what we hope to do with you with our time here today. We're, we're gonna introduce who we are and what we're doing, the vision and history of the Power in Place Collaborative, a little bit about what we're doing now and imagining into the future. And then we're gonna offer uh, perspectives across faculty, community, and student on how we're going about doing this work. Hopefully throw a few strategies your way as we discuss roadblocks and challenges to participatory placemaking work across our communities and then open it up for discussion and we'll pass it on to our co-facilitators in this session. So Bobby, your first, do you mind introducing yourself? Not at all. Good evening, uh, Sunshines. My name is Bobby Ruffin, and I am a community partner with this project. I'm with Burlington Recreation and Parks, and I get to serve as the director of the Mako Bigelow Community Center at North Park. Uh, Shanice? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shanice Sellers, also a community partner of, um, in this project. I am the executive director of the African American Cultural Arts and History Center. We are a nonprofit <laughs> located here locally in Burlington. And Vanessa? Good afternoon. I was trying to find my mute button. I'm Vanessa Drew Branch. I am an assistant professor at Elon University in the Department of um, Human Services Studies. Um, and I'm a pleasure to, to work um, and to be here with you all today. Hello again, my name is Sandy Marshall and I'm an assistant professor of geography in the Department of History and Geography at Elon University. And I specialize in political and cultural geography, including the geography of memory. Thank you. And I'm Danielle Lake. I'm the Director of Design Thinking and an Associate Professor at Elon University. My background is in feminist primatist philosophy and wicked problems. And I dropped a link in the chat box I wanted to say real quick to make sure that all of you got a chance to introduce yourselves in case we don't have time to tell us why you came. And hopefully that means we can direct our conversations to you. And then I'm super excited to have Hannah introduce herself. I'm Hannah. I'm a sophomore environmental studies major at Elon University. And I was one of the students in the place and place making course in the fall. So I'm really excited to share my perspective on the project later on. Thank you everyone. So uh, before we begin telling you all about our uh, experience in place and placemaking uh, this last fall and collecting the oral histories um, of um, members of the black uh, neighborhood and African-American communities in, in Burlington and uh, Alamance County, I first wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, to this work. Uh, it began as a partnership with the African-American Cultural Arts and History uh, Center in the fall of 2018 as part of uh, my course, Power, Place and Memory. The goal of this course was to examine the power-laden processes that contribute to the production of place and how dominant ideologies, including white supremacy, manifest themselves in physical spaces and modes of place-based commemoration. 
Uh, in working with the African American Cultural Arts and History Center, we sought to use oral history interviewing and digital storytelling as a practice of counter memory that could speak back to these dominant depictions of place. And this was uh, especially important to, uh, to then uh, founding director Jane Sellers, uh, who sadly has passed, the late Jane Sellers, um, who had uh, uh, at that time unsuccessfully attempted to uh, have the predominantly African American neighborhood of East Burlington registered as a historical um, um, area or, or neighborhood, uh, but she was deeply invested in uh, using uh, walking tours, um, establishing museum, historical signage, uh, documentary, and his, and oral histories to nevertheless uh, um, pay tribute to and create space for historical memories of that community. So we sought to involve Elon students in that work as a way of engaging them in the local community. As I mentioned, uh, we, we use oral history and digital storytelling as part of this work. Oral history has a long um, history of, uh, of um, a, of use in participatory research uh, in, in ways that seek to democratize um, history and open it up to uh, participatory forms of knowledge production. And in this, it shares an ethic of participation with digital storytelling, which likewise uh, seeks to center participant voices. And we've got some uh, references for you there, and I'm happy to, to look more closely at those later. Um, and uh, in our current iteration of this course, uh, we, we deepened our engagement with the literature from uh, Black geographies, including this notion of uh, a Black sense of place that comes from Catherine McKittrick's work. Uh, and through this theoretical lens, we sought to understand how race and place are intertwined and how they're, they're, they are socially produced and contested categories. Um, and we sought to, uh, again, drawing on McKittrick, we use this notion of Black sense of place, um, which seeks to analyze racial violence um, but does all, also insists that uh, black sense of place is not um, solely um, um, uh, defined by by that violence, but there are other other forms uh, of, of vibrancy. So we sought to move away from um, uh, just deficient notions of, of place or place uh, notions of place solely predicated on violence, but to, to deepen our understanding of of um, of a black sense of place within Burlington. So a little bit more about this partnership right now. Uh, we formalized this over this past year with the Power in Place Collaborative, which combines the African American Cultural Arts and History Center with the Michael Bigelow North Park Center and uh, faculty and students from Elon's campus uh, to really move this work forward and to co-create that shared vision of what these projects and what this partnership will look like and then to sustain it beyond individual semesters or courses. And so we've had others interested in joining this work uh, and we've been navigating those next steps. Uh, we spent this summer designing this work in order to launch it in the fall, and that included meeting every other week or so or more, co-designing the projects, how we're assessing them, uh, when, when we're inviting uh, community members in, how we're conducting interviews and co-creating the, the narratives and the digital stories. It included walking tours of the local community outdoor and, and virtual kind of Zoom interviewing given uh, social distancing guidelines and safety and health practices. And so part of this is about trying to understand how do you do this work in our community how do we understand our histories with the restraints of now? Um, we are grounded in a commitment to mutually beneficial community university partnerships. And that's what's kind of feeding into some of that work and, and that relational emergent design. And so as a part of that, reimagining what do we want to do moving forward into 21, 22, uh, creating community partnership agreements and really setting that visionary work looking forward. As a part of that commitment, uh, and, and a part of that work, we had students begin by sharing their own stories so they could feel what that lived experience would be like when they asked community members to share their, theirs. We had, uh, we had to do training on how to craft digital stories uh, on the tools of that, but we also really dug deeply into the participatory action research practices, the ethical challenges of this work, the epistemological challenges, right, all of that. And so at the same time, we were really trying to dig into the theory and the praxis and live this as we went through it. With those commitments in mind, this was also a part of a research study, right? A scholarship of teaching and learning. We're really interested in understanding how these practices support trans local learning. How does it build relationships? How does it help us situate ourselves? How does it foster an awareness of global engagement of uh, humility and intercultural learning? How, do you, how does this compare to traditional forms of engagement where students travel or, or other forms of service learning? Uh, how does this approach compare? And so as a part of that work, we uh, engaged with the Global Engagement Survey 
which is a formally validated survey instrument that a lot of others have been using really across the world. So we could compare what we're learning to what others are doing. So that's a pre and post survey that includes like Likert or scale questions, but open-ended questions. So we could see what, what's happening here. What do students value? What are the challenges? But it's also a part of a mixed methods longitudinal study. So that's one piece of it, right? But we also just have observation and analysis of written reflections and assignments, as well as follow-up interviews and focus groups where we wanna understand the value and the challenges of this work, not just at the end of the semester, but one year, two year, and four years later, as students go out into the world as they navigate their next steps. And so we're just in that beginning stages of that, right? This just happened this past fall, so we'll continue to, to track that. But as a part of this partnership, this work's gonna continue into next year, and these courses are gonna to continue to be offered. And Vanessa, if you would like to talk a little bit about uh, your role as well as in the Power Place Collaborative. Absolutely. So once again, looking for my mute button. I'm sorry, y'all. So um, my role in the Power and Place Collaborative is I'm my background is in social work. And so a part of um, what I drew to or I think I brought to this work was, yes, we're looking at these communities through a strength based lens, which is very much um, a cornerstone of social work and human service um, studies to practice. But we also wanted to look how, look at how um, social issues are also place based and very sensitive to the experience of place. So the spin and the interdisciplinary um, kind of course content that my uh, senior sem seminar course brought was we were um, asking also additional questions about um, certain social issues that have been experienced in Burlington. Some of the social issues um, were around teen health. Um, I think Bobby may have been interviewed and asked a few questions about um, teen health. Um, it, it, just to get a good understanding understanding about how people are experiencing um, the social issues in their place, right, and how they are constructed in their place. Um, so that um, as human service workers go out into the field, because we are training the next level of practitioner, um, that they understand that the interventions also have to be place sensitive, right? They also have to be constructed with this kind of community um, narrative in mind. Um, so I currently live in Charlotte. It's a very different uh, metropolitan setup than Alamance County. And so the interventions also have to be constructed um, to meet the needs of the residents. Um, one of the cool things that I thought um, that this collaboration really brought together was that it um, flattened the hierarchy that oftentimes um, students go into this work feeling that they have to be the expert. Um, I spent a lot of time with my seniors unpacking that are the people that we are interviewing. Um, I have an affinity for older adults. <laughs> and so the people that we're interviewing are absolutely experts. Um, and so we have to lean into their knowledge base. And that really allowed them to kind of shift their thinking about the power dynamics, right? Um, that we definitely hold some uh, professional knowledge, but this experience, uh, this lived experience is a valuable tool to help to helping and to contributing to um, our community. One of the major things that as I um, craft my career at Elon that I, I really am focused on is how we can work with and become a part of the, the Burlington Alamance um, community much more uh, in a much more tangible way so that we don't kind of feel like uh, or have this Elon bubble, right? This academic bubble where we only engage um, with the community when we need something. So we need volunteer hours or we want to um, conduct research on, not necessarily with. Um, and so we are, this collaboration, um, while it is very academic, for us, it is also kind of cracking the bubble, the edges of that bubble and expanding the boundaries of our campus community so that the lines are much more blurred um, with the Burlington and Greater Alamance um, County uh, uh, community as well. So we become one. Do you want me to keep going, Sandy? On that note, uh, no, I was also looking for my mute button. Uh, on the note of community <laughs> engagement, we'd love now to um, invite um, Bobby and Shanice to, to share their experiences with this project. Oh, go ahead, Shanice. Okay. I, I didn't know if Bobby was going to go first or not. Um, 
So once again, uh, my name is Shanice Sellers. I am the executive director of the African American Cultural Arts and History Center. Um, our focus has been on preserving and collecting and documenting um, the African American local history stories that exist here in Alamance County, because there's a lot of um, stories that happen here that the community um, isn't much aware of. It's like little known black history facts. Um, and of course, Sandy and my mom, who was the person that started this organization, um, had connected uh, probably two or so years ago uh, on continuously documenting um, oral stories. And so we continued um, that partnership. So what uh, we bring through uh, this partnership with Elon is to connect the community to Elon, as, as Vanessa was um, discussing, and reaching out to those community members who we feel are the ones that we we definitely need to collect those stories. Um, so when we when we started out doing this project, we were making a list of who do we need to try to get to first um, to preserve this history and to preserve these community stories. Um, so we bring that to to this um, partnership here, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Bobby. Thank you, Shanice. Um, I have been excited about this work since we started. Um, just to give you all a little bit of background information about the Mako Bigelow Center, um, before integration, North Park was the only park where Black people could go. So there's a rich history um, that follows us. And so a big part of my job is to try to preserve that history um, as well as move forward. Um, since that time, there's been a, a dynamic in the Burlington community where people in East Burlington, which is where we're located, it's like an us and them type dynamic. So East Burlington and then everyone else. And so um, it's really important for me, you know, I hear people share their, their stories with me when they come into the community center, but those stories are not documented anywhere. And so um, as a part of this team, we get to do that. Um, when I transition from um, just part-time work with recreation and parks to director, I had three main goals that I wanted to do um, throughout my time there. And the first was to um, engage more in intergenerational work. So there's a song that I love that says, when young people talk to old people, it makes us a better people all around. So <laughs> I keep that in mind um, when I'm doing this work and, and um, especially within this project, we get to, um, you know, just that communication between our interviewees, the Elon students, and then we have some of the, the young boys from our King Academy program, which is a boys mentoring group. Um, another goal that I had that I want to um, keep in mind is to connect community groups, as well as to collaborate with a local organization. So we get to do that um, with this work. So, like, yeah, um, so I, as a student, ended up coming into this class because as an environmental studies major, I was really interested in urban environments and, you know, cities and all the problems that we're facing. And this class was about place. So I thought that would tie in really well. Um, and I ended up getting a lot more than just knowledge about place out of this class. Um, it was very non-traditional. We started out with a background of a couple readings, like the ones that we talked about earlier with McKittrick, um, but it was a lot more than just learning about it. We went on a tour of Burlington, which is in the picture here. We had the city planner come and talk to us. Um, we obviously interacted a lot with various community members throughout the interview process. I personally had the honor of interviewing a woman named Catherine Smith, who was the president of the MLK Coalition. And that interview was probably the highlight of my fall semester. It was such a strange semester with COVID, but this woman just had so much passion for everything she does in life. Um, and so obviously this class impacted my learning of both oral history telling and place. Um, we really dug deep into what place is and how it's not just a physical thing, but more of this dynamic social construct. Um, we talked a lot about the sense of place that people have today and how that's different for a lot of people. Um, just with various power geometries and such. Um, but like I said, we also looked at oral history, telling techniques, how to interview, how to um, make a community more visible. And so rather than us telling their stories, we just kind of provided an outlet for them to tell their own stories. Um, and then at the end of the class, we kind of gathered all of this together. Uh, because this was an honors course, we are all required to do research and 
a lot of us already had ideas for what we wanted to do, but this class really forced us to consider different ways to look at it. So instead of just going with what we initially thought, we now took into consideration, okay, If we're doing qualitative research, how can we better make sure that it's community-based and participatory? How can we make sure that it's human-centered? Um, how can we make sure that we are taking into consideration different power dynamics and different senses of place? So yeah, that was my experience with the course. So I think that um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the um, challenges and also the opportunities that we had um, come across during this first iteration of um, this collaborative course. Um, so one thing that was an opportunity, but also a challenge was time. Um, it, we really had spent a lot of time during the summer developing the relationships, communicating, really planning out what we had envisioned for this um, interdisciplinary cross course relationship. Um, and then how we could really effectively and meaningfully integrate our community partners. Um, and so that took up some time, right? It's not just throwing a syllabus together and saying, hey, we're gonna roll with it. We really were intentional about um, how and how this would look and feel for, for everyone um, that was involved. Um, it did include a lot of time outside of the actual physical classroom, which most of us wanted. Um, and while that was an opportunity, I think a great opportunity, there also was some challenges. So my class was taught on um, opposite days than Sandy and Danielle's class. And so while we really wanted to do some really cool stuff in terms of integrating classes and having these, you know, multi-level uh, ranked teams, it, it posed a little bit of times in terms of challenge, I mean, um, challenges in terms of time and how do we manage that. And then there were also just some uh, COVID made it difficult for us to really engage with our King's Academy um, students because they were out of school for Zoom. We had some, you know, space issues. And so it, it really left um, some challenging roadblocks for that. However, um, those are things that are also opportunities for growth, right? That we can definitely see how now we can integrate King's Academy into the next iteration of this, um, maybe in some different ways. Um, Bobby has uh, given us some space outside perhaps and maybe suggested that we are meeting with the students outside or we are using some other form of platform to really integrate the multi-generational um, experience as an example. Um, I am all about getting our students outside of the classroom because real life happens outside of the class space. So this class was situated outside of the class space. My class, um, because of rain and all kind of weather, uh, inclement weather, had the opportunity to do the walking tour virtually, um, which was actually really dope. So um, Shanice and um, a co-facilitator, uh, really did a good job of taking us through the highlights of the tour. Um, and so it was really trying to find ways to bridge the gap, even when we weren't able to physically be outside of the classroom. But a lot of the, the interviews were done virtually, but also um, at North Park, which I thought was really awesome. The hope is that much more of the activities can happen at the actual North Park facility or in um, East Burlington community so that students can actually, like I like to say, put their feet on the ground um, so that they can feel the energy of, the, of that space um, because there is, some, there is something to be said for having the sense of a place being connected physically to a place. So we're looking for that as an opportunity for the next iteration. And then this was an iterative process. We are going and looking at all the loopholes. How can we make it better? I tried to switch my class this semester or for next fall, I wasn't able to do it, but we are attempting to try to see how we can make this better for the next go round, right? How we can increase um, the output for our community partners. You know, I cried on just about every one of the, the videos. I'm also a big cry baby, um, but how we can make that even better for the next go round, right? And then how we can also improve the research element, um, how we can also make sure that the scholarship and the community output are 
you know, better, right? That's the evaluative process that many academics go through with every course, right? But this for us is much more meaningful than just a course evaluation. It is how can we improve so that the relationships, um, what our community partners are receiving from us um, feels just as valuable as what I know that our students have gotten from them. Thank you. And uh, Bobby, Shanice, or Hannah, if you have additional strategies and recommendations or stories that you wanted to share, I wanted to hold space for that, as well as just anyone that has questions and wants to unmute and speak up or put your question in the chat box to ask us about this project or next steps or how it's relevant to your work. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. I'll just add that, you know, I really found it valuable to um, link with community partners uh, like myself and Shanice with the um, with the center, um, just because, you know, anytime you're doing something for the community, you have to be in community, right? And so there's real value in, um, you know, gaining partnerships with folks who are already doing that. So that time piece is not um, as intense as it could be. So I just wanted to add that. I also wanted to let you know that we put a link in the chat box to a website with the videos and stories that have been crafted that are up there. Uh, we also, if you have like particular interests or questions, we put, the, put, put those in there as well, but you can see some of the stories are located here. Um, we can share links to our websites and our emails if you have questions on that. That This piece to time as well, that's part of, a, we have a speaker series that's a, that is a part of this work, trying to keep the emphasis and focus on that both inviting in speakers from our own communities and from farther afield. So that translocal learning of how can we support each other in doing creative work resiliently. Uh, and, and one of the reasons we have a design forge, a virtual kind of high flex convening in early June to help with anyone interested in this kind of place-based participatory project planning. If you want a couple of days, a couple of sessions to be in relationship with those that you're designing with and to think about your 2122 vision where we're trying to hold space for that to support ourselves and to support others doing this kind of work. So you can see that on the website links that we're throwing out your way. Any questions? Hannah, were there any other recommendations you had from a student's perspective on how to do this well or not? I thought um, one thing that I didn't mention is that the digital stories with our community partners weren't the first digital stories we did. Um, we started with one of our own, which I just thought was a good way to kind of ease into it rather than jump right into something we had never done before. Um, but it was still a very long process, which was another thing I enjoyed. It wasn't like you were just meeting this person and interviewing them, submitting the project, and then moving on. We had several conversations with them. We had email chains with them. Um, we had a showing where they got to watch the video we made about them and talk about it. And I just feel like that made the whole process feel a lot more like a process, you know, rather than just a class assignment, which is something that I really enjoyed. And I just want to give a big shout out to Hannah's group because their, their story was really awesome. On that note, to speak to this issue of time, one of the things we've been doing is pursuing grant funding uh, consistently to make sure that we can spend even more time in relationship with community partners, with interviewees, to invite them in, to connect, to be together, so that there really is more time to co-create and iterate and revise and, and share these stories in a deeper way. And so um, that's part of our next steps as well, is how do we sustain these projects because they we need the time to do that. Yay, a question. <laughs> It's from me, one of your co-presenters. Um, and my apologies if you spoke to this already. Sometimes in Zoom, it's like the information goes in one ear and out the other. Um, I was curious about, given the sort of content of your work, given this large team and all of the different partners who differ across age, across race, across institutional affiliation, across so many things, across disciplines, um, could you speak to somebody speak to a little bit of have you all spent time working with the sort of like micro relational dynamics within this partnership and how you resolve like conflicts or just 
um, how you kind of approach those relationships on a very micro level. Um, so I, and any of my colleagues can jump in. I don't think that we have addressed that explicitly. Um, so I think they, this, unless I'm been off of that uh, group dynamic friends, um, I don't think we've talked about that explicitly, but one thing I can say is that the enthusiasm and then the professional respect, you can feel it. Like, I think they, the, whenever Bobby talks about the project, it's like, it makes you want to be her friend. <laughs> Whenever she talks about North Park, it's like, no, no, I want to hang out with her and have coffee. When Shanice, as Shanice, like hustles to get the cultural center up and running, it, so I think that it builds the relationships that we want our students to have with community members in general, right? Because they see us really interacting with one another, like, no, you're just a dope person and I respect you professionally. So I, I we, I don't think explicitly we have done that. Um, but I just haven't, I've, I've also not seen um, necessarily the call or the need for that type of work explicitly, if that makes sense. I think that's a great question. And I would, I love more to be more aware of that um, intentionally. One of the ways I've tried to situate myself is that moments to be honest about exactly what Vanessa is saying, that I value this work in each of them so much and admire them so much that I'm sorry, I will be devastated if I let you down or, you know, like, uh, don't like, so just being honest about that, like, wow, actually this means, and, and we've had these moments where it's been a really powerful, hard year for many, many. And so that there's been these deep moments of gratitude that we've already shared together. Like we said, crying goosebumps, like to be in these stories, to be in these histories, like the amount of gratitude I have for this work and holding ourselves to that. I hope there's been moments of, I think, articulating that to each other. And then also sometimes my fear of, wow, I wanna really make sure I'm showing up in the way that you need me to. And let me know if I'm not, because this, this is something that I wanna prioritize. So, so pieces of that, if that helps. I would just add one last thing, and I know uh, we're, we're probably short on time, but um, so I, again, completely agree with my colleagues that uh, a lot of this has just um, emerged organically um, as any relationship would um, based on shared interests and, and, and mutual admiration of one another's work. Um, and we, we have tried to at least formalize those expect, expectations though in, in community agreements, which we revisit from year to year, um, just making sure that we're all kind of on the same page about what we expect from each other uh, in terms of those those outputs or those deliverables and, and what we're doing and, and how we're meeting and, and what, when and where we're meeting. Um, so we have those with each other. And then we also um, have community agreements with our students so that they're, they're also aware of these relationships dynamics. Uh, that's one of the, the, the tricky pieces of this is that, you know, we're, we're all about this kind of iterative design and participatory design. And yet um, that, you know, that has to take place necessarily before students enter, enter into that space. So we kind of have these pre preformed relationships and then we're asking students to, to enter into that and, and respect that. Uh, and they, they have opportunities to, to impact that as well. Um, but we, you know, we have to have multiple kind of agreements with different constituencies to make sure that everyone is, is, is held accountable to each other. And I just would like to add, I think for all of us, there's like a genuine love and care about uh, the, this project that we're, we're trying to accomplish. Um, so I think it, it reduced, well, I don't think we've had any conflict, thank goodness. Um, but because we care about this project so much and the outcome of it and the whole process throughout it, um, I think what Sandy was saying, having everyone be on the same page about that general overall goal um, makes the communication and this this team work is is honestly effortlessly. I I this is one of I do a lot of community partnerships here recently, but this is probably one of my favorites um, because I love working with the students and I love the outcomes that come along with it down the road because um, now we have students from other classes reaching out to us after hearing about this project or other professors reaching out to us after after hearing about this project. So it just continuously build. So I just love this whole collaboration um, that we're doing with this. Oh, it is now time to move on to the presentation from Tulane. And I believe we will begin with Malia Vaughn. Yes, actually, why don't we have Clara go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. <laughs> 
Uh, hi, my name is Clara Kreitziger. Uh, I'm 16 and I'm a junior at Benjamin Franklin High School and I'm an assistant crew leader at Grow at Youth Farm. Thank you. So I'm Molly Afanen. I'm a research fellow at the Phyllis M. Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking at Tulane University in New Orleans. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca Otten. I'm a professor of practice and director of strategy and engagement at the Taylor Center. Hi you guys. Um, my name is Kayla White, but I go by Kay White. Um, I am a crew leader and a visions uh, legacy facilitator um, at Greta Youth Forum. I also done a few visions uh, workshops with Tulane and I'm also a junior um, at the university with a major in social work and a minor in mass communication. So thank you to our co-presenters from Elon and Burlington and to Anne and to Araceli and to the audience for being here. Our goals today are to share some of the models that we're using, um, particularly in a class that Rebecca and I both teach, Introduction to Social Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship, through our service learning partnership with Grodat Youth Farm where Clara and Kay White are both youth leaders. And we're gonna discuss some findings from our research on how this experience fosters our students' multicultural learning so that we can connect our insights to a wider conversation about where critical multicultural approaches sit within social innovation. And as we begin sharing our work on this place-based community engaged learning, it's really important to speak to the land and to um, its indigenous inhabitants that we are standing on. So before European colonization, roughly 40 native tribes inhabited and traversed what we now call New Orleans, but they knew it by a different name, Bulbancha, which is a Choctaw word that means a place of many tongues. So we recognize the people who came before us and continue to call Bulbancha home. And that includes the federally recognized Chitimacha tribe the Kushada tribe, the Gina Band of Choctaw Indians, and the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana, as well as the state recognized Adai Kado tribe, the Biloxi Chittimacha Confederation, Choctaw Apache community, Clifton Choctaw, the Four Winds tribe, the Grand Cayu du Lac Band, the Ile de Jean Charles Band, the Point of Shen Indian tribe, and the United Homeland Nation, as well as the Atacapa Ishak Nation of Louisiana. And as we honor the past, present, and future generations of those who have stewarded this place, I would ask all of us to reflexively consider our connection and responsibility to the land, as well as commit to the healing of ongoing harms of colonialism, genocide, slavery, racism, exploitation, and environmental destruction. And so we would love to get um, any and all participation from the audience at any point. But as we reflect on these harms and healing those harms, we also wanna make space to invite the audience to drop in the chat. If there are any such harms that are particularly top of heart for you right now. So this would be just a place to share and for us to witness that. Yeah, so top of heart for me right now is the murder of eight people, including six Asian Americans yesterday in the Atlanta area. Thank you for sharing that. That was on our minds as well. And if there's anything else, please feel free to continue sharing in the chat. Becky, is there anything you want to say? No, I just think I wanted to give a little space to recognize that this stuff is happening all around us right now and um, it's impacting us as we show up here. And so if that's important for you to have that space to acknowledge that, I wanted to, to offer that for folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our host also said, I'll also share that I'm keeping the people of Myanmar in my heart right now and thinking about my trans faculty colleague that has been targeted by harassment and hate speech in his office twice this past year, reflecting on all the levels at which this impacts us. Yeah, 
thank you. So as Becky said, this is happening all around us and that's what we're asking us to commit to that healing for. So Becky, do you wanna go ahead and share some project background? Yeah, thanks Malia. Um, so uh, Tulane University was selected as a change maker campus back in 2009. That's when our social innovation work kind of officially launched. And we also worked closely with Grodat Youth Farm as it was founding in 2010. This specific partnership um, was established in its current iteration really in 2014 through our social innovation and social entrepreneurship minor, which is uh, administered through the School of Architecture. And there's also, uh, we also work at a university-wide center for social innovation and design thinking at the Taylor Center. Um, a couple of things around Tulane's context and how that informs the way we work with Grodat Youth Farm. Um, Tulane is a predominantly and historically white institution. It's a, a research one institution and it's located in New Orleans, which is a majority black city. Um, there's also significant differences in terms of socioeconomic status. So um, we have a, a uh, in 2017, our median family income of a student at Tulane was $180,000, um, with 13% of the student population coming from families in the top 1% of economic earners. And that's located in a city where the median household income of a New Orleans resident is just under $37,000, which is significantly less than the US average. So all of this context comes into play in terms of our relationship with the community and how uh, we prepare our students to work with the community. Uh, additionally, less than 20% of our undergrads come from the greater New Orleans region. And we have a, a required public service component of their undergraduate experience. So that means that service learning is often the first meaningful interaction that our undergrads are having with New Orleans citizens outside of a connection to Tulane. And that matters in how we uh, relate to our partner and how we prepare our students as they move into working with Grodat and other partners. Um, so I'm gonna have uh, Clara and Kaywix share a little bit more about Grodat and how they work uh, at that organization. You can go to the next slide, Malia. Um, so at Grodat Youth Farm, it's a really, it's an amazing community where you work with a lot of people who are under 21. Um, the way our system functions is there is essentially a crew leader, two assistant crew leaders, and then 12 crew members. And we all work together through farm work and working with the land, but also through workshops around all sorts of issues that can be from food deserts to diversity and sexual assault. We have a lot of different issues. And one of the major parts about GrowDat that makes it so special and effective, I believe, in our crew member leadership program is that it's a very open environment and everybody becomes very tight knit, which helps kind of create a very productive environment. Um, just to build off of what Clara just said, um, I feel like Greta is a, just like a great space for people to come in and learn about different things that, that they can typically learn within high school. I started working for Greta when I was 16 and a junior in high school. And so um, it just really was like an outlet for me to come in to a space and just truly be myself. And Grodet is a space where no matter who you are, what you look like, what is your socioeconomic status, you're able to come in, fit in with other people that you might normally don't fit in with, and just learn about the land and let them have to take care of the land and how can we um, just generate ideas to solve social issues going on in the city. Room. Thanks, Claire and K. White. You can go to the next slide. Um, so GrowDat nurtures a diverse group of young leaders through the meaningful work of growing food. And I think you can see um, some of those diverse leaders here with Kiwa and Clara. Um, I'm excited to hear more from them later in the presentation. Uh, back in 2014, when our faculty colleague and the founder of GrowDat were thinking about how this partnership could 
work, one of the things that GrowDot um, was really adamant about was that our tooling students needed to learn about uh, their visions multiculturalism curriculum before they could come to their eco campus because that was such a core part of their organizational culture. And so here I've listed a couple of the modules that we talk about um, that come from this is curriculum that uh, really comes from our partner GrowDat. Um, we talk about how we can engage in respectful dialogue while discussing uncomfortable or difficult topics. We're asking students to reflect on their intersectional identities, including the ways that systems of privilege and systems of oppression show up in their lives. We're asking them to think about um, monoculturalism and pluralism and how we can move towards pluralism at different levels within ourselves, in our relationships with other people, within institutions, and also within our larger culture. And then we're starting to reflect on um, how modern oppression shows up in our lives. How might I um, engage in dysfunctional rescuing or blaming the victim as a white person? Um, and also how do we think about um, ways we can interrupt these manifestations of oppression? And then finally, something we've started to introduce um, is this idea of feelings as messengers and how can we be aware of the feelings that we're experiencing? Um, and, and feel okay with the fact that we're experiencing a feeling and that that's an appropriate thing to feel in a classroom experience or in a learning experience. And then what might that message, that feeling be telling us in terms of what we need? Um, Kay, Kay White or Clara, do you have anything that you wanna share about um, how the Visions curriculum has impacted you? Um, just to add on to a little bit about what Becky just said. Um, so I, was introduced to this work very young. And so with visions, I was able to like really understand what I'm feeling and actually put that into work and actually just pinpoint the reason why and understand like why I'm feeling that way and really express that in like a more healthy way. And I'm, so it was like really nice. And I use this in my day-to-day conversations with other people. I might not exactly use the same language, but the same context is still being used within my conversation so that I am clearly stating, okay, I am feeling this way. This is what landed for me and why it landed for me that way. And this is how I need assistance from you to help me not feel this way. So it's like a really good curriculum that I use at work and when I'm out of work. Yeah, I would say adding on, I feel like another thing Visions does really well is help people broaden their perspective of their own communities, New Orleans, and even our country as a whole. And I think one major part of it is sharing your experiences with certain issues, whether that's race, gender, sexuality, etc. And through that, people can gain more perspective and see things in a way they weren't before. And I think that's very valuable in creating more well-rounded community leaders. Thanks. I would say this also um, has transformed me personally and professionally. And in addition to incorporating it into this introductory course, um, our students are asking for us to incorporate it more in the other courses in the minor. And we also are using this in, within our office in terms of how we uh, work with each other. You can go to the next slide. The other model that we started to really hone in on is this idea of critical service learning. So this, this model on the left is from Tania Mitchell uh, and she differentiates traditional versus critical service learning with a focus on really a social change and systems change orientation around really understanding what's causing these problems um, and how do we get to addressing the root causes of the problems working to redistribute power within the relationship. So valuing and seeing our, our community partner as being, uh, as teaching our students and, and then bringing the, their curriculum into the classroom. But also our Tulane students go to GrowDat and they are following the lead of high school youth who are practicing how to lead. And so we are trying to redistribute power in all of the ways that we do this work and developing authentic relationships. And that is um, uh, circled by continuous reflection. And Duke also has a helpful tool if this is a model that's interesting to you called the Duke Service Learning Conversations tool. So 
sorry, was muted. <laughs> Becky began this research a few years ago and I joined in recently. Um, and it involves a qualitative study of case study of the, this curricular experience, integrating the visions training with our service learning into the introduction of SIC class. So we asked in this uh, research, how are the principles of critical service learning applied to this atypical structure, given our university level constraints? How does the critical service learning model affect student learning outcomes in the course? And what specific factors at the curricular level impact the student learning experience? And so we've attempted to answer this primarily with interviews with students who've taken the class and pulling from a sample from different semesters over the course of five years, as well as a few interviews with partnership stakeholders like Grodat Youth Farm crew leaders, administrative leadership, and former um, SICE instructors. And this is complemented by review of course and organizational materials and eventually will include student reflections. And we can share more about the method methodology outside of the presentation if anyone's interested. But it's important to know we took this approach for two reasons. Although we need much more research on these learning experiences from the partner perspective, GrowDat leaders asked us to research our students learning first to sort of learn more about the effects of the vision model in this partnership. And we've been teaching this class for five years, going on five years, and we want to identify that short term learning that shows up in students reflections while in the class, as well as the longer term developments you see with students who took the class several years ago. So this first slide just basically shows that stu for students, this experience was unique within Tulane or other comparable experiences. And it was also high impact for their learning within the course. It was a positive-ish experience, um, but it wasn't always fun or comfortable, which is important because student satisfaction or enjoyment of an experience isn't always the same thing as learning, right? And so this slide talks about students and stakeholders' reactions to the dimensions of criticality that Becky mentioned within this service learning structure. And so, you know, our students were there to do manual farm work, but they were also taking these workshops that Clara spoke to um, and really learning from these uh, GrowDat crew, assistant crew leaders who were practicing in order to lead this with future GrowDat youth cohorts. So our students were there to learn and be a willing audience for GrowDat youth to practice. Um, and I'm not gonna read all of these quotes, but just know that our students picked up on this atypical structure. When it came to redistributing power, it took our students a while to get this type of role reversal. But once they did, it made an impression. And with this quote, student quote here at the top, there's this beautiful tension in recognizing, okay, I'm just a body here and wanting to feel important, but also appreciating the political implications of not being centered. However, one of our um, assistant crew leader respondents felt our students might have caused some harm because they didn't all always understand these roles or the implications. In terms of relationships, students felt an unexpected level of friendship and camaraderie, and they were surprised that relationship building was emphasized as a process and an outcome. Uh, one of our stakeholder interviews did question if authentic relationships could really happen within this time frame, noting that trust takes a long time with two groups coming from very different social positions. In terms of social change, students were also not expecting to come in and learn so much about the social problem our partner was working on or to develop a sense of commitment to systems change. So you see here, they're noticing, you know, the activities were helpful in learning about food deserts and food insecurity rampant throughout New Orleans. Uh, where and it aren't rampant where two late students are typically coming from to put the work in a broader context. So you can see where students were able to recognize these features of criticality, it was impactful because it was surprising flipping that script of how students expected to contribute. Often many of them came in with a certain mental model about service that centered themselves and their contributions and ex envisioned a one way relationship in which they gave but not, were not transformed. So that's what they envisioned. They didn't envision being transformed. 
Challenging their expectations about how the service would go was crucial to their multicultural development, although some of our stakeholders cast doubts on whether these criteria for criticality were met from all perspectives. So Clara and Kay White, that was a lot of information, but I'm really curious to hear your reaction to some of these quotes, both from students and RODOT stakeholders. And just to ask you what you see here and if this resonates with your experience. I think one thing that really speaks to me was about redistributing power because when I first started at GRODOT as a crew member and then now as an assistant crew leader and when Tulane students first came, I was, it felt pretty uncomfortable at first just because of the normal power dynamic of I'm way younger than you. I don't know why you would be listening to me. I don't even know which standardized test I'm taking and you're doing major career steps. Um, but I think through GRODAT, that kind of mental attitude has been transformed and now I'm way more comfortable with it. I have people in the crew now who are a couple years older than me and I'm definitely much more okay with it. And it's definitely something that I think has transformed me to, to the better because it speaks to the fact that knowledge doesn't just come from age. And uh, yeah, I think that's a really important thing you learn at GRODAT. Um, that same thing that Clara just spoke about kind of resonated with me as well. Um, I also was a ACL at Groda and during my time as an ACL, at first I was kind of skeptical because I was just like, oh, you guys are older, you know, so I really was just like, I don't know if there's anything that we could talk about, you know, because I'm a high school student and they're a college student, but then over time it got easier because like, they were just so nice and so understanding. And so by the second meeting, um, I feel like it was just like a breeze for me. And so now that I am in my second year of being a crew leader at Greta, um, I, I just, I learn from my like, different people. And so my approaches are always different based on the, the people that I'm interacting with. But um, the Sciences students have always just taught me, you know, how to work with people that are so different and to enhance my learning of how I can show up in a space and with people that are different from me that come from different backgrounds that are with different schools than me, you know, so just really seeing how they think and how I think and how I can be flexible in those spaces. Thank you for sharing. So getting those notifications that we're at time um, so I'll just quickly go through and we can spend more time on this if anyone wants to go back, but we just noticed that other factors um, that influenced our students learning were the visions curriculum in particular and some of the sticky tools around conversation guidelines and analysis of yeah, oppression and privilege and that historically included and excluded groups that Becky mentioned. So that kind of stuck with them. Um, and another major factor was that GRODAT was an exemplary social enterprise. And so that really deepened students learning by getting to see an organization really model these equity, diversity and inclusion values and practices in their organizational culture and their mission and their programming. And so that was really impactful and important. And it led to different changes in our students. We noticed quite a range, but really increased knowledge of social change, especially around the food system knowledge of behavior change while communicating and collaborating across difference and increased knowledge and self-reflection related to identity development, privilege and oppression, as well as intersectionality. And then finally, there were influences on their, you know, making changes to career choices specifically related to thinking about the purpose of their career and valuing organizational culture in that pathway. So Becky, do you wanna take us home? Sure, we just had a couple of reflections. I think you've heard from all of us the, the power of sharing power um, and what that looks like. And I think speaking to Malia's initial question, part of sharing power um, is that there are these relational micro dynamics that we have to be kind of attending to and thinking about how power is playing out here. Um, we at the Taylor Center and at Tulane think that centering equity, diversity, and inclusion in social innovation education is essential. I think it'll look different for different uh, higher education contexts, and that's why I shared some of our higher education context. Um, we really value these place-based approaches 
and uh, it's important to attend to the specific university context and constraints. So I think we can open it up to questions now. And I uh, also, if questions have popped up from the Elon presentation, we can kind of open this to more general questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can have more of a gallery view conversation. I'm not sure how to raise my hand digitally. <laughs> so I'm just going to raise my hand physically to unmute. Uh, wonderful presentation, really, really fascinating uh, work and projects that you all are involved in. Um, I loved the positive-ish comments uh, because uh, I completely agree that you know, just thinking about student enjoyment or satisfaction is definitely not the, the only measure of, of learning or nor should it be the central one. And I also uh, really appreciated Becca what you said in terms of um, this being a transformational experience, this type of work being transformational, not only for students and young people, but also uh, professors and community partners. And I, I certainly identify with that. Uh, Claire, I also wanted to pick up on something that you said and maybe invite um, you to elaborate and, and Becca or Molly or, or Kay White. Uh, you mentioned that this, this work really gave you a new perspective on New Orleans and even the country as a whole. Um, so I'm really interested in, in, in learning about how that, that place-based engagement um, gave you a, a new sense of a new sense of place or new uh, perspective on New Orleans. And Kay White and anyone else um, would also invite you to chat more about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, I am originally from New York City and I moved to New Orleans almost two years ago. And so I wasn't really particularly connected with the New, or New Orleans community as a whole. And coming to Grodat and getting that job, I think really grounded me as someone who lived in New Orleans and as a part of a community here because I was learning about, I was getting to know people and I was getting to hear different experiences from New Orleans, just not just people from my school or even from the internet. It was more real perspectives, the good and the bad. And I was getting rooted and involved in social issues in New Orleans. And I was working to make a difference, I think. And in that sense, I became way more rooted in a New Orleans community. And I think that also affected how I viewed our country as a whole through race and gender and sexuality, just by a lot of the visions, tools and workshops we went through. I also think some, something that's coming to mind as you ask that question, Sandy, is um, I remember hearing a lot of Tulane students say like, oh, wow, I was really surprised by this similarity I have with this assistant crew leader, or I was really surprised by this difference I have. And being able to have them reflect on like, well, why were you surprised that that either was a similarity or a difference? And what might that mean about your socialization and how you've grown up? Um, and I think seeing those light bulbs for our undergraduate students is always um, really um, fulfilling for me. And I will say I have those light bulb moments for myself too, when I'm uh, getting to know assistant crew leaders or other folks at Grada and my, getting to know my undergrads at Tulane too. I had a question for the Elon group. Uh, I noticed that you are also working with, uh, with, with high school youth. And I, do you have similar experiences with the students from King Academy? I'm not completely sure. I'm sorry if I missed it, how old those students are uh, or uh, is, is your experience different? I can speak on that. Um, our experience was very different. Um, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, there were definitely some constraints as far as um, involving our kids. Uh, the ages are nine to 15 for those boys. And so um, we were only able to get what three of them involved in the project last fall. And so um, we definitely, we weren't able to um, build those relationships as in depth as we would like to. It was more just like an introduction, which um, was definitely a learning experience for us and, and something that we'll take into the next semester as we continue the work. 
Bobby, that just makes me think, I think one thing that I, I hadn't been intentionally thinking about before this partnership, but has really stood out to me is this, the value of these near peer relationships. Um, and how they are like very close and we can use that in terms of subverting traditional power dynamics. And that's something that I wanna continue to explore further is like what, how can we use that to really challenge um, our undergrad students uh, as they're kind of often they're first or second year students. So they're really just starting to, to get to know New Orleans. I will say, as you all were talking, I was just impressed that you all had created this space where these young people feel safe enough to share um, their own, um, you know, human experience and just their lived experience, and then just creating that community. Anytime you do that is a success already, um, because they don't typically have those outlets where they feel so safe. So yeah, and I think Grodat gets all the credit for that. And that was part of Grodat saying like, we want you to join our organizational culture. We don't want to become a part of Tulane's organizational culture because it's really different than what our Tulane students typically experience on campus. Yeah, I think that part is really significant. The learning that we had from our partners and it sort of speaks to the way that Becky and I have also been positioning this work is thinking about like evolutions, sort of curricular evolutions in social innovation education and sort of wondering what the role is of like multicultural learning modules and approaches are within that space. And, you know, it took sort of the you know, real social enterprise in the community using these approaches to clue us in and say, hey, you really have to take this more seriously. Um, and they didn't say it that way, <laughs> but that's that's what I heard. Um, and I think that's really important. So yeah, and again, Groda gets all the credit. So we've been, um, they've been modeling it for us. One thing that struck me listening to both projects is that in both, both projects, there was a moment where the student, one of the differences the students was nego were negotiating was the difference of age. And that um, I'm assuming most of the oral histories were uh, taken from people who had more life experience than your typical college student. It's probably a safe assumption. Uh, and then, of, of course, the, the differences that were described uh, so in such a great detail with uh, the presentation from Tulane. Tulane. And I was wondering if the Elon group can talk about how some of those uh, differences are negotiated in the oral histories and that the idea of the historian, even the undergraduate historian might see him or, him or herself as an expert, but what you're really there to learn about the life experience of the person you're talking to and, and they're the truly the, the, the educator and the expert in that situation. So how do you negotiate those, those conflicts? I can speak first before I forget. Um, um, I think that one thing that was helpful for us was to find, um, how can I say, just a commonality for the groups. Um, as you all were talking, I was thinking of a moment um, where we had some of our King Academy students, those boys are um, 10 and 12, they're brothers, and they were conversing with the Young Men's Club for Better Relation who are all like 78 and older. And so the, the conversation that allowed them to, to um, like merge was sports because all of the young men's club, they were all coaches back in the seventies. And so I think um, one tactic that you can use is finding just that commonality, something they have in common. Even though the interview, interviewers are not experts, you know, they might feel a little warmer and a little more um, welcome if you find something that they have in common before starting that conversation. Um, I don't know if you all want to add anything. Sandy, you look like you want to talk. <laughs> I want to just add something just real quick, Sandy. Um, one thing I thought was cool is that we had a moment where um, we were talking to the students about tell the story that hasn't been told. And Shanice and Bobby were um, giving the students feedback about the directions of the stories. Um, I appreciated that because then it allowed it allowed the community to kind of dictate the narratives, right? Because um, oftentimes we will come in and we will tell the story um, and we will control how the story is 
the direction of it. So I really appreciated that Sandy um, and uh, Danielle created that space in the classroom where Bobby and Shanice could kind of say, yeah, maybe we should tweak it. Maybe this is a storyline, maybe. And I thought that that was really a way that to, to get at the community member expert um, as an expert, as a live expert um, ex kind of thing. Yeah, so I mean, from my point of view as someone who was conducting the interviews, that was, it seemed to be purposefully constructed when we were um, given who our community member was going to be. We really weren't given anything more than their name slash a possible title if they held one. Um, like I did not even know what Catherine Smith looked like. The Facebook was dead. The Google images was dead. Like, so I think that kind of helped not going in there with a story in mind. We really just went into this hour long block of time with a list of a variety of possible questions about their childhood, um, whether that was in Alamance County or whether it wasn't, how that kind of played a role, um, their current life, um, any sort of like relevant history that had to do with place, whether that be in Alamance County or outside of Alamance County. Um, so I know we learned so much about Catherine Smith that wasn't included in the story. And that probably was the most difficult thing about the project because we were making a three to five minute oral history, which is really so, so um, condensed when you think about just how much content we got from these people. Um, but yeah, it was definitely intended to be a conversation rather, with an, rather than an interview. That way, we were really getting the story from them. Sandy, did you want to add something? You have three minutes left. Um, just echoing um, what, what Hannah and Vanessa said, which was um, just really trying to create uh, opportunities for that intergenerational dialogue to take place. And, um, and I think, uh, again, just familiar, being familiar with the responses of all the students, um, there was this, you know, challenging of expectations. And I think a lot of students uh, went in with particular, you know, stories in mind or particular narratives of, of that community in mind that were very much challenged um, by, their, by their encounters and interviews um, with members of the community. They then had to engage in a kind of iterative process, which which they drove on on their own, um, following up from the from the oral history, checking in that the transcript was correct. Then from that transcript, producing a paper script uh, of a shortened version of that story, right? Because so often oral histories just get archived and cataloged away, and no one really gets to engage with them anymore. So that the idea was to kind of mediatize a short. A short, um, you know, snippet of that story for others for for public display, and so you know, getting feedback on on the on the paper script from from the community member as well as from our community partners, and then producing a draft, um, getting more photos and and, and media um, and documents from from the interviewee. So it it it, it enrolled these students into a, an ongoing relationship with their, our community partners. Um, uh, which, uh, again, from our experience and theirs, I think was transformational. And, and again, we hope to create uh, more opportunities for that in, 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 in the next year when we hope, hopefully are less socially distanced, uh, more opportunities for in-place um, um, oral histories, as well as, again, including our, our younger members from the King's Academy in that process. Oh, thank you, everyone, and particularly our panelists. This was a very interesting discussion and two wonderful programs that I'm looking forward to learning more about. Thank you all. Thank you so much. It's so, such a joy to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your, your wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thanks, Claire and Kay White. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for our own little intergenerational conversation. <laughs>